Haha. <laughs> Here we are. Hello and welcome to another Solana tutorial. Today we're gonna talk about well the basics of Solana once again and specifically we're gonna have a look at commitment levels because that's such a basic concept that a lot of people still get wrong especially new developers who's starting out that might be a concept that they're not really familiar with but that would be really good to know if you're a Solana dev that you understand the commitment levels of Solana what they're called what they mean and how you can work with them correctly so that's what we're gonna have a look at today and basically this is just gonna be a short yeah giving you the basics kind of a video we're not gonna develop much I'm basically just gonna rant about how Solana works for the next 30 minutes so if you're up for that here we go I have those slides here from one of the workshops that's one of those talks that I give a lot actually it goes through the, all those you know blah 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 why why Solana how accounts accounts and programs and all that stuff but all I want to get to is this part okay so step it back we start oh my my hand is not long enough Wait, no, wrong direction. For fuck's sake. Okay, uh, back. We start out with a client. So that's, I mean, maybe do this. Client. That's what we develop usually as devs. We build that part. Or we build that part that then runs on the user's machine, right? On their mobile phone, in their browser or our own script that we have running locally. That's the client, right? That's where we build the transaction. That's where we say what we want to do. You know, I don't know, system program transferred. We build that instruction and uh, put it in a transaction. We then serialize that transaction and send it to this guy, the RPC. So the RPC client, usually I just say the RPC because I'm lazy and I don't, you know, take language seriously. It is the RPC client because RPC stands for remote procedure call and the RPC is what we do. So we call the client with a call. So really it's the RPC client, but honestly, everybody just says the RPC. So we send it to the RPC, which handles that transaction and then forwards it to a validator. Now this, is the thing that is actually producing the block. Basically how Solana works, there's a leader schedule. Hold on, that's also somewhere in this presentation, I think. Here, Solana is made up of several validators, several being, I don't know, how many do we have currently? We currently have 1,770 validators. We had a bunch more, but then we got rid of a few potatoes who were just dragging us down. So. It's now fewer, which is probably good. And there are over 2000 RPC nodes. And we can see there's always one producing a block and then there's the next one. So, so we got a few hundred validators in the network and the way it works, there's always one that is currently producing a block and we call that one the leader. The leader gets to produce a block. Now, how is the leader decided? That's done based on stake weight. So the more stake a validator has, so the more sol is delegated to that validator, the more slots they will get allocated. And that is done deterministically. I don't know exactly what is taken as the seed for that. The proof of history tick height from which then deterministically an algorithm derives the leader schedule, you know, based on stake weight. And that's how it works. The details are not so important. Basically what you want to understand is there is a leader schedule. I am getting too bright because the fucking sun is coming up and that leader schedule is valid for an epoch, I think. And therefore we know at any time who is the leader. So who is the validator producing the next block or getting the chance to, you know, they have the slots allocated and it's always four slots. So every leader gets four chances to produce a block. They can produce four blocks ideally. And then the next validator is the leader. So the leader will receive the transactions and then put them into a block because Solana is a block chain after all. And then that block is propagated to all the other validators such that they can update their state. And the same with RPCs. RPCs, you can think of them actually as validators, but not voting. Validators is maybe also a bad word for them. 
because they are block producing. Anyway, whatever. The, the details are again, not so important. Back to here. So we got the validator. So the RPC will send it to the leader, the next one. And then the validator itself will put that transaction into a block. And you know, that instruction might call a program, which then writes to state or whatever, though that that's the, the regular thing, right? A, a transaction can succeed or fail, which lately has caused a lot of confusion because failing transactions, they landed at the validator and they were processed. Then there are transactions that are not processed that really like fail to be submitted to the cluster. And we don't have a good name for that. Like transactions that never land. So to recap our client, we, our script, whatever sends a request to the RPC client, which then checks the transaction and forwards it to the validator. So much for the basics. We need to understand that to make sense of commitment levels. Now we can talk about commitment levels and what they are and why the heck we need them. The state or quality of being dedicated to a cause. I am committed. How committed are you? Processed, not finalized. Commitment issues, huh? <laughs> you only go for processed Solana jokes and commitment issues. An engagement or obligation that restricts freedom of action. Well, well do we need that to understand Solana commitment levels? No. But it's, you know, related. Otherwise we wouldn't have chosen that word. Solana Web 3. Oh, we need a connection. Oh, and a commitment. Yeah, yeah, but first a connection. Key. Who cares? Give me a key. So we create a connection, we get the key pair. Oh, look, there is also the commitment level here, the default commitment to confirm. But what does that mean? We'll get there. So. When I now send a transaction, should I just send an empty transaction? I'll just send an empty transaction. There is a send and confirm transaction that takes the connection and the transaction and the signers, and then it takes options. Now check that out. In the options, I have commitment and maximum retries and that sort of stuff. But one of them is commitment. And those are our options. That's a lot of options. And really only three of them are really relevant. And that's confirmed, finalized and processed. I think the others are legacy names and some other weird stuff. Query the most recent block. Okay, so this apparently those definitions when querying the state, like when we get a block hash, we need to say what com commitment we want to have. But before we get into that, maybe it's smart to give good definitions of what those three things mean. And for that, we got to go back to this slide where the validator is producing the block. All of this is about timing. The issue is what we would love to have is that every validator at all times has the exact same state, obviously, because we have one state one don't even put the second finger up but for technical and physical reasons that doesn't work because light needs some time to travel around the world and the world is big and we have validators all over the world so it is physically impossible that they all have the same state at the same time we're not doing quantum stuff so basically when the validator built the block, it says, Hey, this is my suggestion for a block. Please include that in your state. And it sends it around via a gossip system that we don't want to go into. Is that called turbine? Whatever. I don't actually know the, the technical validator stuff that well, but basically that information needs to somehow reach the other validators. And that takes some time because obviously it needs to arrive there first. And then those validators, they vote on the block. They are like, well, is this leader corrupted or do they follow our rules? Because that's what validators are there for, to validate the state changes. So the validators get to vote on blocks. They can say, yes, I approve this block if everything worked fine or say, no, we do not accept that block, maybe because some malicious state change happened and somebody just 
invented Sol on their address or something, or just because they are on a fork that the validator does not support anymore because it's on a different state already. So some kind of invalid state transition happened for the validator for them to vote against that block. But in the regular case, assuming that all of the validators behave normally or like non-corrupt and the state is transferred quickly enough and they have all the information, then the other validators will of course accept the blocks and vote for them. And at some point enough validators have voted that it's unlikely for that block to ever become invalid. And it becomes more and more unlikely that the block ever gets reverted or becomes invalid the more other blocks have been built on top of that block. As with Bitcoin, right? With Bitcoin, we, you know, wait long enough for that block to be finalized because it's unlikely once there are so many other blocks built on top of it that we're ever gonna accept a different fork from it where that block is not included. And those things, those levels of how far we got is basically what the, oops, sorry, what the commitment levels represent. So let's go through it. The commitment levels in order are processed, confirmed and finalized. Number one, process. The transaction has been processed by a leader and put into a block. So one validator has accepted this transaction. That's the commitment for process. Then confirmed, you get once two thirds of all validators by stake weight have confirmed this block where the transaction is in. So if 67% of stake weight have voted that the block is valid, we've reached the commitment level of confirmed. That's the second step. And then once it's confirmed, it is already highly unlikely that that block is not included because again, two thirds of the validators have voted for it. But it could theoretically still happen that for some reason it needs to be rolled back. However, as far as I know, confirmed commitment has so far never rolled back. Although don't quote me on that because I don't actually know. I at least have never heard of it. But if you have a very, you know, sensitive application where you really want to make sure that it's actually persisted in the state and definitely not gonna change anymore, you will want to wait for the third commitment level finalized, which happens when 32 blocks have been built on top of the block that contains your transaction. After 32 blocks, we've reached the maximum, it's an arbitrary maximum, but it is a maximum of confirmations. So to be more specific, 32 blocks need to be confirmed on top of that block. And then it counts as finalized. And then it's really pretty much set in stone. Like then you're like, now what is optimistically confirmed? That's a great question. That's somewhere in between processed and confirmed because when the cluster stops, where do we start again, right? What is the state that we then take? And we take the optimistically confirmed block. And that is something that we somehow figure out I don't know how that's done, but for our application, it's not really relevant. What's relevant is to understand those commitment levels. Let's go through them again. Processed, one validator has voted on it. Confirmed, two thirds of validators have voted on it. Finalized, 32 blocks have been built on top of it and have been voted on by two thirds of the validators. And not just voted on, accepted. Now, just to check, did I get all of that right? Because I just got that from memory. I do wanna go through docs just in case. The commitment metrics gives client a standard measure of the network confirmation for the block. Clients can then use that information to derive their own measurements of commitment. So we have the three processed, confirmed and finalized. And this is a nice little table. Once we reached processed, the block definitely has been received. The block is on a majority fork, you know, because it can happen that the cluster forks because it's too slow. And then this one proposes this one and this one proposes that other one. We are on the heaviest fork measured by the current entity. You always need the reference, right? It's always for one like RPC or validator because what is processed for one validator might not have been processed by another one or what's confirmed for one is not confirmed for another one. Yeah, although if I say that maybe it gets too confusing, so maybe leave that out. 
the block contains the target transaction. So the transaction has been included in a block that's already guaranteed with processed. So with processed, we already have the transaction in the block. It's not just that it's been received, it has been put into a block. That's what we get with processed. With confirmed, we additionally get that over 66% of stake have voted on that block. Yep. And then, aha, okay, I got that wrong. It's not 32, it's 31 plus, 31 or more on top. So including the block, we have 32 blocks that are confirmed. So it's 31 on top or 32 in total. Then we get finalized. Yeah, cool. So we go with the standard of confirmed, which is usually the default, but might not be. And what that will do, it will send our transaction, you know, it will sign, get a block cache and send. And let's have a look how long that takes to get the signature. Now let's just test, it's not gonna work yet. It took us a bit more than half a second because we get a transaction simulation failure. We get that right away but we did have to send it all the way to the RPC client because only the RPC client knows the state, right? We don't know the state. We're gonna get to the checks in a second, which checks do we do, which does the RPC client do and which one does the validator do. For now we know, okay, the RPC client gave us back. No, it doesn't accept that transaction because it doesn't simulate. And that round trip to the RPC and back took us like half a second. Cool, so let's, airdrop me a sol, then I should have some sol on that account. And now I try that again. I get a signature actually pretty quickly, only 800 milliseconds. Try that again, one second. It's taking longer and longer, 1.7 seconds. 1.7. So I now get a consistent 1.7, but somewhere in that range, right? So somewhere in the seconds, 2.7, the, oh, the more often I do it, the longer it takes. Oh, 1.4. Now we get in the other direction. Yeah. So we're around one to two seconds and we can look at those transactions. Nothing interesting is happening here. It's an empty transaction that is just paying a transaction fee. On mainnet, that would probably not even work right now. <laughs> but that's a topic for a different video. Maybe the next one. That's that. Why does it take so long? Because we send and confirm that transaction. So not only do we send it, we also wait for that transaction to be confirmed. So to have reached that point where two thirds of the stake have voted for that block. And that, you know, takes in the range of a second. Now, what happens if we go finalized? Then guess what? We will have to wait significantly longer because it takes significantly longer for 32 blocks to be built than for one block to be built. So, yeah, 13 seconds in this case. And this is definite. So potentially we might get a little bit different times than mainnet, but the ballpark is still this. There we go, 15 seconds. And once we get to looking at that transaction, it is already finalized. We already have max confirmations, but we can look at that, those confirmations coming in when we get our transaction faster. So what if we go to processed? Now we should get the result a bit quicker because we only wait for that one validator to put it in a block and we don't wait for the other validators to confirm it, right? So here we're in the range of like half a second to a second. But yeah, if we are quick and we paste that in here, we might still be able to see the confirmations coming in, yeah? 26. 30 and then once it hits, hits the 32, it's max. Okay, so I'm also not particularly clear with my wording and I also just realized that those are two different things that have the same levers. One is the confirmation status and one is the commitment level. Basically, the confirmation status is related to a transaction. A transaction has a confirmation status that's what I was talking about here. A transaction has a confirmation status of not yet being processed, then processed, then confirmed, and then finalized once enough blocks have been built on top. That's the status 
of that transaction. And now on the other side, in our code, we define our desired commitment level, basically saying this is what we want our transaction to have achieved for us to be happy. So with a commitment of processed, we're not happy until it's processed. With a commitment of confirmed, we're saying no, processed is not enough. I want it to be confirmed and so on with finalized. Confirmed is not enough, but I want it to be finalized. That is then the commitment level, you know, same, same target, right? Always those three, but once it's the status of the transaction and this is now what we want, check if the transaction status has reached that commitment level. Good. So what I'm doing here is not the most accurate measurement, of course. And also, you know, TypeScript is definitely not the most efficient or whatever, whatever, but we get the idea of the higher the commitment level the longer we need to wait for this send and confirm to come back with a signature. Because with finalized, it will only come back with a signature if we reach the finalized level. Processed, it will come back much quicker. But with processed, you also run the risk of the transaction not actually being persisted in state because it's just processed by one validator. And as we have read, forks are possible on Solana, also common even. And if we happen to be on a minority fork and get discarded, then even though that transaction got processed, it is not persisted in the state because it never reached confirmed or finalized. Didn't you just say you're on the majority fork when you processed? Yes, but only for that one validator. That validator thinks we are on the majority. It's complicated, yeah, I yeah, know. But that send and confirm function here does it all for us. Let's dissect that a little bit to learn more. And therefore we will manually set the fee payer and set a recent block hash. Also for getting the block hash, we can specify a commitment level. Okay. I just say send raw transaction and here I can specify the pre-flight commitment. We'll get to that in a second. But first I ask you the question, why? Does this now fail? Block hash not found. Okay, that can happen once or twice when the cluster is overloaded, right? So we just try it again. Oh, we get the same thing again. Okay, we'll try one more time. Huh, maybe there's something wrong in our code now. Why is it failing? And that is an issue with, guess what? Commitment levels. Now I am querying a recent block hash with confirmed and I am sending and I'm not even confirming at all, right? If I just send, all I do is say RPC here, have that transaction, please send it to a leader and give me the signature. I'm not waiting for the transaction to have reached any form of confirmation status. And that's not where the issue is. The issue is in the pre-flight. So let's test something. What if I said finalized here? Would that change something? And my prediction is yes, it would. Cause here I get a transaction signature. Was that just random? No, it keeps working. Okay. One third time. Yes, it does still work. So what is different here now? Why, if you're a good student of mine, maybe you can explain why does it work now and it didn't work before? Isn't that super confusing? Yes, it is confusing. That's why a lot of people struggle with it. That's why I'm making this video. Yay, learning stuff. So can you explain? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, continue, yeah. And why? Yeah, you almost got it, almost got it. But uh, <laughs> let me explain. Maybe you completely got it. I can't really tell you are too many people. So basically it's an issue with timings. The whole time here, we're just talking about timing. Yeah. Yeah. Basically the RPC then says, well, I can't simulate this one because that's not a valid block hash. It says block hash not found because it is in fact too new of a block hash. Check this out. If I await a new promise that does absolutely nothing for, I don't know, a second, 
that might then already be enough for it to work again. So I get the block hash. Nope, one second is not enough. Well, let's wait five seconds. And then I submit it and I still get block hash not found. Maybe there's something else that is going wrong here. But after 10 seconds, you know what? I'm gonna make a freaking loop out of this. Let's see if that is ever a valid block hash. Oh, I tell you, Rust is so much cleaner. I, I've been working with Rust lately and it's just so much cleaner. But I'm working with TypeScript now, so here we are. So let's see, is there any time when you would accept this transaction? If so, how many seconds? Oh yeah, here we go, after 10 seconds. You keep submitting the same one and that of course is already submitted, so. So yeah, we would need to wait entire 10 seconds until that block hash that we queried here, the simulation would accept. So what the hell is happening here? And where are we failing? Let's finally talk about who is checking what in this entire system. So on the client, when we build the transaction, we can do checks like, are all the signatures present? Are all the signatures valid? Is the transaction small enough? Because, you know, it can be too big. You know, all those sanity checks that we can make on the transaction itself, where we don't need to know anything about cluster state. Those are the checks that we can do in our client. So for instance, if I would not sign this transaction, then I immediately get a signature verification failed. And that is within the client code. We did not reach the RPC yet because that sort of stuff I can check locally. But when all those checks went through and I actually sent that transaction to the RPC, the RPC then also does those checks, right? Is it a valid transaction? Are all the signatures present? If they're not present or it's not a valid transaction, it will of course not forward it. But what the RPC then also does is it can simulate the transaction with the RPC's local state. Because as we said in the beginning, an RPC is almost like a validator. It's just not participating in consensus, but it has all of the Solana state available. So it knows what are the balances of all the accounts or what's the data in the accounts. How do the programs work? And it can execute a transaction, simulate the transaction by, you know, running through the code of all the instructions and then give us the result. And this is done because if the transaction would fail, right, because some state doesn't, not enough Lamperts on there or, or, or some program would make it fail, then it would be a waste to include a failing transaction in a block. So the RPC would already say, well, this transaction is failing, check that again. You probably don't want to send it and come back to me with an error instead of forwarding it to the validator. But those are checks that only the RPC can do. We can't do that locally because we don't have all the Solana state. So that happens here. When we send it here, it gets simulated. And that's the so-called pre-flight check. So before we send it flying to the validator, we do a pre-flight check. Would it even fly, right? <laughs> would it even succeed? And if it wouldn't, then we come back with the error. However, in some cases, this causes trouble because the RPC state might not be perfectly up to date, especially if you're, you know, working on state that has just been changed. Remember what we did in that one video on common errors where we do an airdrop and then immediately send the transaction? Same thing, the RPC will think that we'd have insufficient funds even though we actually have sufficient funds, just it's not up to date. State is not up to date. And that's a similar thing that is happening now, except the issue is we're working on different commitment levels. Because the RPC is taking in all the state, all the information that it gets from all the validators. And so those incoming transactions and uh, those incoming blocks, they also have different commitment. Or wait, the right word is confirmation status. Because the newest information coming in might have just been processed and not even confirmed yet. So on which state do we want the RPC to simulate that we can specify with, check this, the pre-flight commitment. So we could for instance say, dude, it's 
perfectly okay to simulate this transaction on processed state, then this should actually work. There we go. We get a block hash that is confirmed and we simulate with processed, so it's fine. Even when simulating with confirmed, it should also still be fine unless we get in the load balancing of this address because there might be several RPC, several actual servers behind this one address. If one RPC has a different state than another one and I get the block hash from one that is further ahead than the one that I'm submitting the transaction to, then that could be an issue. But the pre-flight commitment is now the same, so it should be fine. What we were encountering in the beginning was that the pre-flight commitment was finalized, apparently, because then it's most likely not gonna work and it will tell me block hash not found. Why? Well, because I'm getting a recent block hash, the most recent one that has been confirmed because obviously I want the block hash to live as long as possible. So I'm getting the newest possible one. Maybe I don't want the one from process because it could be on the fork that is then actually not valid. So confirmed is a good choice here, but then we want to simulate it not on finalized state. Because if we do that, it simulates on state where that block hash is not even valid yet. And therefore it will fail and tell us block hash not found. And then we have to wait those 10 seconds. So apparently the default pre-flight commitment seems to be finalized for this Web3.js. One other possibility is of course to say, hey, dear RPC, I don't really care if my transaction fails or I'm fairly certain that it won't fail. So please don't even do any checks and send it to the validator as soon as possible. That I can do with skipping the pre-flight. That's also one thing we can do here. Skip pre-flight, set it to true. Then it should also work, right? We also get a transaction signature. But here we don't know if that transaction now actually gets confirmed or anything. In this case, it actually did not. Interesting. So we skipped pre-flight, we got the signature, but that does not mean that the transaction, just because you get a signature, does not mean that the transaction actually landed. Whether failed or successful, it didn't even land. Let's try that again and see if this one lands. So it comes back relatively quickly here, right? We just send it to RPC and once we send it, we just, we're done, right? We don't, we don't await anything. We skip the pre-flight checks. This one also doesn't go through. Let's go back to false. Yeah, block hash not found. Because we're getting a confirmed block hash. Somewhere on the way, the block hash is checked for validity and is considered to be, you know, invalid. With a pre-flight commitment of confirmed, you were landing transactions, right? Confirmed. So they land. So what's the difference here? That's interesting. Yeah, really weird. It's cool that we analyze this. Okay, but this one did land now. Is there a bug somewhere? No, also comes through. Okay, maybe that my testing was just a bit off or it was just instable for a moment. Who knows? Anyway. So if we skip the checks, if we say forward it anyway, then it lands at the validator and gets put into a block. If we have the correct commitment level where our block hash is actually valid, then the RPC simulates it, says yes, okay, would go through, forwards it to the validator, also works. It only doesn't work if the block hash is too new for the commitment that we specified for the simulation. So the pre-flight commitment then we get a block hash not found because it's too new and that has been an issue sometimes. So block hash not found might just mean that wherever you're simulating doesn't have the right state. You can even be too early. Block hash not found does not always mean that the block hash has expired because after 150 blocks a block hash expires. But that's again a topic for another video. Sending transactions and retry logic. But this video, I'm already making it so long. I thought this was like a quick half hour video. I'm already freaking recording two hours here. But I guess I'm already almost done here anyway. I think I talked about everything. I mean, the validator, of course, also does some checks. The I mean, it does, of course, the most checks. It will do 
is it a valid transaction? Are all the signatures present? It will do all the SIG verify. Obviously without valid signatures, the validator will of course not put the transaction in the block and all those checks, right? And then it will actually try to put it in a block and execute it. And then if the transaction fails, well, then it just fails, but it's still put into the block because the validator gets the transaction fees. So it will be incentivized to also put failing transactions into the block. So that's fine. So yeah, I hope that at this point you understand what those confirmation levels are, what skipping pre-flight is and what the pre-flight commitment is. Let's do one more thing where we send the transaction and then we manually confirm it. So now we've just gotten the signature. Now we basically want to do that thing again, just that we don't send the transaction all the time because we've already done that, but we just confirm a transaction with a strategy and the strategy will be with a signature and a block hash. Then I flatten this in here as well. So then we have a valid confirmation strategy with this latest block hash in there and the signature. And let's see how quickly that gets confirmed. Again, here we just send, we don't confirm. And then here we confirm every second. So let's see what that does. We send it, that's the signature. And oh wait, maybe I should print something for the confirmation. Cool. What we're getting back is the confirmation status for that signature, which the first time we queried it was just processed. The second time we queried it was already confirmed. And then we could have waited a bit longer and then we would get finalized. So let's do that again. So send the transaction. Now we wait for the first confirmation. I would like to do this non-blocking. Oh, wow. What? So we didn't get any results and then suddenly it got finalized. Couldn't find the transaction and then finalized. So there the RPC apparently was a bit behind and then it got the information and it already was finalized. Try again. Just gonna do then. There we go. Now it got quicker through though. And we already get the confirmed, 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 confirmed. Confirmed and after 13 seconds, 14 seconds, we get finalized. Nice. Try it one more time. Yeah, already getting confirmed quite. So yeah, it depends on the state of the RPC, how quickly it can serve us this information. And it also counts up the confirmations until they get null when the confirmation status is finalized. So yeah, that's pretty cool. That's how we query this stuff. Cool. Yeah, and I think with that, I want to end it. I hope that you can now tell what the three different levels of commitment or the three different confirmation statuses are. S steady. Go ahead, tell me. Processed. Confirmed. Finalized, you're right. And can you also define what they are? Even senior Solana devs get that wrong, including myself. Like today when I said 32 instead of 31. <laughs> but I guess, you know, whatever. What What's one confirmation, right? What's one block? Yeah, I think this is pretty basic knowledge that every Solana dev, no matter which level, should really know. When you're starting out, it will really help you understand why something is not working and what you can do to fix it. Because if you don't understand it, you might encounter problems where you're like, I don't get it and there's such a simple solution to it, you're just not aware how those commitment levels work and to which point you need to confirm it. Oh, that's actually a great other point. To which point do you want to confirm your transaction? We didn't talk about that. And that basically depends on your use case, of course. There is no clear answer to this because it depends on what you want to do. So let's go through three use cases for all of the commitment levels. So let's do it like that. Yeah, like in class. I give the use case and you say which commitment level would be appropriate. You are a merchant who is selling clothing and the customers can pay via Solana Pay. Which commitment level do you take for the transaction to give your customer that piece of clothing or that coffee or whatever it is you're selling, right? You're a merchant, you're selling something. What did you say? Finalized? What do other people say? Confirmed? Who's for processed? No? Okay. Because yeah, I would say processed is wrong and I would also say finalized is almost too much, right? You don't want to have to wait 10 seconds. No, I'm not handing you your coffee yet. You have to wait those 10 seconds until I can give it to you. 
kind of weird because let's face it, once a transaction got confirmed, it is highly unlikely that it will get rolled back. So you can be fairly certain that you got the funds from the client and you can hand them the coffee. So confirmed in that case is pretty safe. Okay, but what if you're selling Lamborghinis and it's a transaction of several hundred thousand dollars? What confirmation level would you like to have now? I would probably go with finalized just to make sure. Wait those 10 more seconds just to make sure that I actually have the money before I hand over the car keys. You know, that's there I have those 10 seconds, right? And I'm like, okay, okay. Now you can have them, <laughs> right? So, and I would probably even do some more checks like that the transaction actually did the exact thing that I wanted to do, that there's no delegate set or anything weird. But yeah, if I've built the transaction and I know what was signed, then finalized would be enough for me. And I say, okay, you can have the Lambo. All right, third use case. No, don't go by excluding the other ones because we already had them. Think about it from the beginning. Maybe I go with finalized again. But let's assume you are a trader and you're doing high frequency trading or whatever. You're doing shit, shit coin trading. Yeah, you're doing high frequency shit coin trading. Yeah, 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 that's what you do. High frequency shit coin trading and you're trying to be the first one to buy that shit coin and you're trying to be super fast in selling them. What commitment level is appropriate here? What do you say? Processed? You did say processed? Well... It was a trick question because really you don't want any commitment. You just want to send it out, skip the pre-flight checks, no time wasting in simulating transactions. We don't care if this transaction fails. Well, actually we do, but that's just casualties, right? We, we are okay with paying for failing transactions if therefore the likelihood of actually landing the transaction successfully increases. So if we're high frequency shitcoin trading, we're literally pumping out the transactions and we don't care about any commitment. No commitment. Shitcoin traders have commitment issues. If you're their girlfriend, you will know that. That's why I'm single. No, I'm not a shitcoin trader. Anyway, so yeah, you do, like we don't want to confirm the transaction at all because we don't really care. Well, actually, we kind of care. So actually, yeah, I would probably, because I would probably resend it if it doesn't land and I keep resending it until it got processed. So if you said processed, yeah, it would be the right answer actually. Processed or we don't care at all. But we probably don't even want to wait for confirmed because resending it after it got processed, th there are the chances of then hitting that other fork that then becomes the ma majority fork and our ones not being included is actually, in I'm assuming, is relatively low. So I would actually stop resubmitting that transaction once it got processed. But I don't know, I'm not a shitcoin trader. Maybe they actually, you know, wait longer or keep submitting until it got confirmed, whatever. But yeah, the point is for those quick things where it doesn't matter whether the transaction went through or not, because we just keep pumping them out, the processed is enough. And I would say for regular transactions, like most transactions, a confirmed commitment level is sufficient. Yeah, cool. And with that, I want to wrap it up. Thanks for watching this video. Keep those things in mind. We will need them for future videos and your projects, of course. That, like this is such a relevant thing. You will need that on your Solana journey if you want to develop anything on Solana. And even if you're not a dev, knowing those things, having a little bit of a technical understanding is helpful. So you're welcome. And uh, I'll see you around in other videos like these. Make sure you're subscribed, like the video, and I'll see you in the next one where we're actually gonna attempt to send transactions on mainnet. Yeah, that, that's gonna be my next challenge. Landing transactions on mainnet while mainnet is congested. Until then, bye-bye.